Hi everyone, this is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm uh, very lucky to have with me my friend John Micton, who is the head of Education and Media Technology and Deputy Principal at the International School of Luxembourg. Um, thanks John for being with us today. Let's just dive right in. Uh, tell us a little bit about how the school is doing learning and teaching these days, supporting families, students, staff, what's going on? Okay, so we're an international school, so we're a private international school that our, our cohort, our community is mostly expatriates and local Luxembourgers that want a education, international education in English. We do the international baccalaureate and we have about 1400 kids and about 300 employees of which 220 are educators and we've uh, we're we are under the auspices of the Ministry of Education of Luxembourg, so we take directions from them. We're not independent in the sense that as a private international school, we can go and do what we want. We can't work under the auspices of the Ministry of Education. Yeah. So we, like all schools in Luxembourg, shut about four or five weeks ago, and we transitioned quite quickly. Basically, the way we did it, we had what we called a phased approach. So the first two days were everybody getting their heads around, being at home, getting your little workspace together, same for teachers. And then the third day teachers posted the anticipated uh, activities and lessons and learnings. And we use two platforms. We were quite strict about only using two platforms. One is Seesaw for pre-K through grade two and grade three through 12 is Schoology. Okay. And those are integrated with Office 365 and Google Drive. And we really, one of the focuses that we were trying was to say, let's not use all these free apps, let's consolidate, let's stick with what we know. And the LMS, uh, Schoology and CISA, are tools that our faculty had used for quite a, uh, we implemented them about three years ago. We had other systems and we consolidated them through CISA and Schoology. So there was... Uh, you know, I think there was a variety of uh, buy-in and skill sets, but everybody, you know, hats off to all the educators around the world. The way people pivoted and took uh, the challenge ahead and in such a professional level is quite commendable and amazing. And I know that's replicated across the world and culture. So I think educators have, again, demonstrated how critical we are and that, yes, we can change very quickly more than people might have anticipated so and so we have been doing but kind of in the same conversations asynchronous synchronous uh what do we do so we've had a lot of feedback from parents and students and our faculty and we uh just are right now in a spring break so everybody's taking a week uh, breather and when we come back we're really looking at uh, a week kind of a window so uh, teachers will post the activities and the week kind of uh, points, uh, learning points, learning activities, projects. So kids log in on Monday, they kind of have an idea what the week looks like. And the idea is that teachers will uh, check in through uh, Schoology conferencing, which is similar to Zoom or uh, Google Meets, uh, doing the face-to-face. -face. And we're keeping the schedule. So if you want, if you're, period two and you're a biology teacher, you could have a little office hour or a face-to-face. -face. But one thing we realized at the beginning, many teachers were giving too much. Right. There was just too much and everybody was feeling, and especially parents who suddenly have to juggle the reality of having kids at home. And in Luxembourg, we have somewhat a unique situation where pretty much all our parents are both working. Uh, so they were working while the kids were going to school. So they had to juggle that. And of course, teachers, as you know, have families too, and they're juggling those dynamics. So I think the big lesson is we were, there was too much and we had to scale back. And I think giving the week gives, allows uh, families to kind of curate and choreograph what the workflow looks like, pending what they are available and not this feeling of being tied to a schedule as such. So I think that's our big learning. The other is well-being is very important and just that personal contact. Uh, you know, for a lot of kids, it's just the fact our pre-K team has been fabulous. Just, you know, every day doing little hellos, posting, and just making sure kids can see each other. And right. I know in the, in the Schoology conferences, uh, which is similar to Zoom, that's been one of the things. Kids just need that time to connect and be silly and just right. feel like, you know, they're there. Because many of them are missing that. 
And for other kids, you know, the reality is home is not the greatest situation. And that's a really respite, in other words, to get out of something that might not be perfect and be able to connect with the teachers. So I think those are kind of the two things that we really realized and just pacing and balance. And I think as a leadership team and teachers, we were all quite exhausted by the end. And we realized that, that recalibration is really important and being mindful of that and uh, being very transparent with our community and making sure that we're communicating that, we're acknowledging the challenges that people have and highlighting that uh, we have a daily communication to both parents and our staff and the students. And I think that transparency and honesty is really important. Not always easy because you have different perspectives. 1,400 kids, you know, basically 2,800 different opinions. And I think we've just tried to be as firm and really be as factual as possible. Awesome. So, John, I know that ISL, like many other international schools and IB schools, places a strong value on sort of critical thinking and higher level learning. How was that translated to the remote setting? What are some things you're seeing that are maybe particularly exciting or interesting? Yeah, I think for that was maybe one of the shifts at the beginning is many teachers were trying to replicate what they could do in the classroom online. And I think that required a lot of creativity. And I think some people misjudged and not out of incompetence in any way. It just, it's the learning curve. You know, I don't call this online learning. I think a good colleague and friend of mine, Stephen Raya at the American School of Milan calls it emergency learning. Right. Because we're just really trying to fill a gap. And I think one thing is this project-based learning. I think projects have been really a nice way to get kids to think differently and critically. Using the opportunity of being at home and the parents and the siblings, using the space that you have at home, maybe the garden or the balcony. I've seen a lot of teachers leverage that, uh, you know, art activities mm -hmm. and really looking at this idea of multimedia projects and less, less kind of this instruction you learn now you try there's right. been a bit of that and i think there is a place for the skills but i think one thing that's really worked is this idea of this notion of project-based learning design thinking mm -hmm. how to leverage that and i think for some teachers there's been that shift but it did require a lot of collaboration i think that's one thing we have noticed is teams that collaborate really closely together are very successful mm -hmm. teams that don't and everybody kind of goes, I use the word rogue, uh, that tends not to work because you get discrepancies. And one thing we keep have really trying to support and understanding is that that collaboration is also an opportunity to share the balance and the workload. And if somebody's not well, you still have other team members that can kind of hold you through. So I think that's one thing that's really uh, come out is the teams that collaborate have been able to engage with this project-based learning design thinking kind of activities. We're, uh, we do a lot of uh, Project Zero work and Kath Murdoch's inquiry. So I think that's been interesting is, you know, looking at how do you transition from the classroom to the online world. And I think that has been very a, a creative challenge and people have just been very innovative in the way they're dealing with it at different levels and different paces. Awesome. So um, we're getting close to the end of our time here, John. Um, you think about, you know, and you referenced some of this, I think probably before, but as a leadership team across the school, what are some things y'all have done that you think have worked really well? I think one thing is listening, is really listening to our community and to our staff, our faculty, uh, our parents, our students. One is uh, we meet every morning uh, from 10.30 to 12, and then we meet again at 4 and 5, and at 4 and 5, we basically digest uh, whatever national news that impacts us yep. and uh, our local situation, and we send out a, uh, an update to the parent community and an update to faculty. And we try to be very uh, candid, transparent, honest, and we also try to highlight the importance of well-being, providing links, articles, maybe videos, and we feel that that being very consistent, we've been doing that actually even before we close down in January, we start realizing with the situation in uh, China that we were anticipating something was going to happen. We weren't sure and we just got together and said, that needs to become a workflow that we need to uh, address. So I think it's just being transparent, being very patient, 
also being mindful as a leadership team, we're on constantly. And I think some of us have realized we need a break sometimes from each other and just you yourself, uh, what is your well-being and who can you go and tap into? So uh, we're very fortunate, and I am sure that's the same in many national schools, is we have a very rich professional learning network amongst the international schools. And we've really tapped into what the Chinese schools in Asia has been doing because they've been in now 11, 12 weeks. And really being very vulnerable and being willing to share whatever we have, not having ownership and just saying, hey, take whatever we've got. And that exchange has been so helpful. Awesome. So uh, looking ahead the next month or two, what do you anticipate will be some of the challenges here at this stage of the you know, process? <laughs> That's a great question. So we have just uh, had a press conference with our Ministry of Education, and they have announced that they're going to have a phased approach of schools opening up. So May 4th, the 12th graders, the final exam year. In Luxembourg, there's a big exam. It's called the baccalaureate. We have the IB. We're fortunate the IB is not going to take place, so we won't have to bring back our 12th graders. But uh, so it'll be uh, May 4th, 12th grade, then May 11th, 11 through 7th grade, and then May 25th, uh, 6th grade through pre-K. But this will be split into two, uh, two groups, so only half the class will come. So one week a cohort will be face-to-face, -face, and then they'll go online and they'll swap around. There are a lot of complications. This is very fresh. And so, uh, as I was just saying, we're going to get together as a leadership team here and digest this and then see what does that look like for us. And so this is, you know, kind of a press conference, very brushstroke. And now we're actually waiting for more specifics. But we've seen now that uh, the uh, Copenhagen International School opened up, I think, was it yesterday or Monday? And now some schools in Austria. So there's a slow movement, very, very cautious. I think, uh, you know, it's still a month away. So we'll have been locked for eight weeks or in isolation for eight weeks. So I think there's a lot of caution, but also an understanding that it could be done, but I'm not sure what it looks like. And that's the challenge ahead for all of us. And I'm sure in many situations in the United States, that's something that all of us will be grappling with globally is what does that re-entry look like? And I think it's challenging and a great, again, another creative tension for us to uh, look for and see what we can come up with. Yeah, absolutely. John, this has been fantastic. Anything else you want to share here at the end? No, I just want to, you know, this, I really have been so grateful for the sharing and the generosity of educators around the world sharing things and people being very open and asking questions. I really feel as a community of learners and educators, the professional learning networks that various people have been tapping in, the ones that you're involved with, Scott. It's just been really hats off to everybody. Uh, thank you from Luxembourg for everybody that's sharing things to us. Yeah, really appreciate it. That's awesome. Thanks, John. Bye.